China has a lot of aspiring rocket companies, all hoping to be someday China's SpaceX, with some more promising than others. But there's one company that's been doing very well over the past 12 months, and this is the story of Landspace. Now, at first glance, Landspace looks like any other Chinese commercial launch company. During the second half of the 2010s, China began relaxing regulations and opening up the space sector, leading to the establishment of more than a dozen launch startups, all jumping at the occasion to develop their own rockets. And Landspace was one of them. It was formed in June 2015 by these three guys, who were a fascinating mix. You had Roger Zhang, 31 years old at the time, a former executive from an investment bank and who would become the CEO. You also had Wu Shu Fan, a technical guy in his early 50s, who had this international background, having worked 11 years at STEC for ESA. And then finally, there was Wang Jianmeng, a pure product of China's state-owned traditional space industry, having spent much of his career at the Xichang Satellite Launch Center and the Beijing Launch and Control Center. So these three guys get together and set up their headquarters in Beijing, in a remote district called Yizhuang, which is basically where all Chinese commercial launch companies went due to just the historical background of the area in launch. And Landspace starts doing what all startups do at the beginning, they start to raise money. And we're in a period at the time when the Chinese economy is booming, with notably record amounts of venture capital being poured into the high-tech industry. Landspace quickly manages to secure money from VC firms, including a couple of very high-profile investors, such as Matrix Partners China or Sequoia Capital China. Additionally, Landspace also gains the support of the municipal governments of several cities eager to attract high-tech companies to their territory. And this is why over the years, among other reasons, Landspace would set up facilities in Huzhou, Jiaxing, and more recently, Wuxi. So Landspace starts designing its first rocket, the small solid field Jucha-1, capable of putting 300 kilograms into low Earth orbit. But soon enough, Landspace runs into its first hurdle. The company attempts to launch in October 2018 from the Jochen Satellite Launch Center, but the rocket fails due to issues with the third stage attitude control system. And starting from there, this is where Landspace starts to do things a little bit differently from its other competitors domestically. Rather than pursuing small solid field rockets further, as their competitors would do like iSpace and Galactic Energy, they decide to put their entire focus on higher thrust, higher capacity liquid filled rockets. With obvious pros and cons, the development of a small solid field rocket is faster, the engine can be bought off the shelf, and this more rapid time to market also creates a stream of revenue earlier for an activity as capital intensive as launch. And this is what a competitor like Galactic Energy would do in the following years, frankly, quite successfully. But Landspace's vision, on the other hand, was that larger liquid-filled rockets capable of deploying larger batches of satellites, notably for satellite constellations, was where the market was going to be. And this whole thought process was coinciding with the early deployment of Starlink and OneWeb, marking the entrance of the space industry into the age of mega constellations. So it's 2019, Landspace abandons the Jucho one they're all in on liquid-filled rockets. They start developing liquid-filled propulsion, and their workhorse was going to be the TQ-12, an engine burning liquid methane and oxygen, providing 70 tons of thrust similar to a SpaceX Merlin engine. The plan was to equip all of Landspace's future rockets with this engine, and this leads us to their second rocket, the Jutra 2. It's December 2022. Landspace has a new rocket ready. It's called the Jutra 2, and it's being rolled out at the Jotren Satellite Launch Center. This is a two-stage medium-lift rocket with five times the payload capacity of the Jutra 1 at 1.5 tons to low Earth orbit. It's a liquid-filled rocket with four TQ-12s on the first stage and a single vacuum-optimized TQ-12 on the second stage. Now, this was an interesting choice. We're very far from the Falcon 9-like architectures of Landspace's competitors. The Jutra 2 had this more traditional four-engine layout, which could be found on China's older rockets. And while this more proven architecture does not favor reusability, it enabled Landspace to get the rocket out earlier than others. And indeed, the first launch attempt is in December 2022, the first liquid-filled launch attempt from a commercial company in China, 
although it fails due to a premature shutoff of the second stage Renier engines. But seven months later in July 2023, Landspace succeeds, and this is then followed by a second success five months later, this time carrying payloads from paying customers. And this made Landspace the second Chinese commercial launch company to successfully launch a liquid-filled rocket, the first company being Space Pioneer, who narrowly beat Landspace by three months. And they also adopted a similar conservative rocket architecture on their Tianlong-2 launch vehicle. Now, beyond this whole rocket architecture talk, there's one other area where Landspace seems to be standing out, and that is launch sites. Chinese commercial launch companies generally haven't built their own launch sites. They don't have to. China has been funding the construction of a new state-owned launch site in Wenchang called the Hainan International Commercial Launch Center. This launch center will have two pads for liquid-filled rockets to be delivered in June of 2024. So on paper, that's great. If you're a commercial launch company in China, it looks like the launch infrastructure is provided and paid for. But actually, things are a little bit more nuanced. There are two pads at the new launch site, with each of them capable of launching 16 times a year. But the thing is, launch pad number one is reserved for the state-owned Long March 8 rocket, so that leaves only pad number two for all the commercial guys. And this is why launch pad number two was designed to be compatible with 19 rocket types in total. 19 rocket types, think of it, that's less than one launch per rocket type per year. And compare that to say SpaceX, which is literally launching a Falcon 9 every other week. I think this is the Achilles heel of many Chinese commercial launch companies. There's a clear bottleneck in terms of launch infrastructure. On the other hand, Landspace invested a hefty sum, some 550 million Chinese yuan, to build their own launch infrastructure in Jotren. And this is why I think, at least for now, Landspace seems to have this unique competitive advantage in terms of launch capacity. The only other company known to go down this road is their arch rival Space Pioneer, which announced last year that they were also going to build their own launch pad in Jotren sometime in the future. Now, as we move on to 2024 and 2025, the priority of Chinese commercial launch companies is shifting towards building heavy lift rockets. We're talking about actual Falcon 9 equivalents, so 15 to 20 tons silo Earth orbit and partial reusability. There are loads of such projects in China and we'll cover all of them in a separate video, but for now, let's keep the focus on Landspace. In November of 2023 in Chongqing, Landspace's CEO, Roger Zhang, unveiled the Jutra 3. This was a heavy lift methlox fueled two-stage rocket capable of putting 21.3 tons into low Earth orbit. The rocket is partially reusable, with the first stage able to land vertically in a similar manner to the Falcon 9, using grid fins and landing legs. When the first stage is recovered, the payload capacity drops to 18.3 tons due to the propellant required for the deceleration burns. Landspace plans to hold the first launch attempt in late 2025, and according to an email exchange I had with them, they will also attempt to recover the first stage during this maiden launch. To achieve these goals, Landspace has begun experimenting with a single-stage demonstrator since January 2024, called the Jutra 3 VTVL-1, with the objective of performing higher and higher altitude hops further down the line. Now, a maiden launch in 2025, this may seem a little bit ambitious. It's less than two years away. But I think one of the key enablers here is that Landspace is reusing existing engine technology. The first stage on the Jutra 3 will be equipped with nine TQ-12 engines, and more specifically, the TQ-12B, which is an improved version of the TQ-12 that's lighter with a higher thrust, so a higher thrust to rate ratio, and also that's optimized for engine reusability. One thing that's new with the Jutra 3, though, is that Landspace is going for a stainless steel rocket body, and the first launch company to do so among China's leading commercial launch companies. Now, stainless steel is an old material in rocketry. It's become a hot topic since SpaceX adopted it for Starship, but it was used in early versions of the Atlas rocket, I believe, as well as the current Centaur upper stage. And it comes with pros and cons. Where stainless steel really shines is its extremely high melting temperature, which is useful for re-entry if you're recovering rocket stages. It's also much cheaper and faster to manufacture and stronger at cryogenic temperatures. The downside is, of course, the much higher density, which means more weight for a given wall thickness. 
So I suppose the thickness will have to be trimmed down with challenges arising in terms of rigidity. Landspace openly admits that this is a new area for them, which will likely require significant R&D efforts. And finally, I just want to wrap up with one very interesting difference between Landspace and SpaceX. Landspace's Jutra 3 will launch from Jochen and Wenchang. And Wenchang is a coastal launch site like Vandenberg Space Force Base and Kennedy Space Center for the Falcon 9. And so we can expect the Jutra 3 to lift off and land vertically on a drone ship or a sea platform in the ocean. However, the other launch site, Jochen, is landlocked with no sea within a radius of a thousand kilometers. So how is Landspace going to land the booster vertically? I recently asked Landspace the question, and the answer was that since Jochen is overall surrounded by desertic areas and sparsely populated, the plan is to build several inland recovery sites hundreds of kilometers away from the launch site in the provinces of Inner Mongolia and Qinghai. Therefore, the Jutra 3 first stage could land vertically on one or the other, depending on whatever makes sense based on the launch azimuth, and then transported back by road to the Landspace Rocket Refurbishment Center in Zhou Tran. So how will all this unfold for Landspace in the coming years? We're arguably entering the most interesting times yet of Chinese commercial launch history. Many of Chinese Falcon 9 equivalents should begin to see the day over the next 12 to 24 months and compete fiercely for the domestic launch market, of which a large part is going to be the deployment of China's broadband mega constellations, but also to a lesser extent, Earth observation constellations, and likely some interesting new launch contracts that we have never seen before, such as China's future low cost commercial cargo program. Landspace, as well as Space Pioneer, have a slight advantage on their other domestic competitors. Their liquid fuel rockets are operational sooner, and they both have or will have their own launch facilities, boosting their launch capacity. But then again, there are also other very well-funded competitors which are not so far behind, so we'll have to see. Who would you bet your money on in this commercial launch race taking place in China? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, I want to say a special thank you to my patrons on patreon.com and YouTube memberships. If you enjoy these videos, please consider joining the community and supporting my work with Dongfang Hour. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.